Okay, fantastic. Um, it's really our pleasure to have Shadi join us today. Um, he has, he comes from the Integrated Electronics and Biointerfaces Laboratory at UCSD, where he is a professor. Um, Shadi came to UCSD from Los Alamos, where he was an Oppenheimer Fellow, which is um, the highest honor for a young scientist at the lab. Um, Shadi is also an NSF Career Awardee, a Teacher of the Year for Electrical and Computer Engineering at UCSD, and a past editor and associate editor for many of our peer-reviewed journals. Um, so we're really, we're, we thank you again, Shadi, for coming. I know that uh, January and February is a particularly stressful time with a lot of, you had a proposal due this week, you're on a study section this week, and so um, thank you for still uh, sitting up and, and coming and telling us about your great science. Um, so, yeah, so today, you know, Shadi's gonna tell us more about this fundamental and applied research um, that his team develops in electronic materials. Take it away, Shadi. Thank you so much, Jan. It's, it's really a great pleasure to, to be with you today. And I uh, appreciate everybody's time to listen to my talk. I, I have a number of, uh, of friends at NAU, so it's great to see you again. And I look forward to, uh, to visit your campus and your department. As you started introducing me, I thought you uh, were saying he comes from the Center of Integrated Nanotechnologies. I'm still, still used to that. And uh, you know, it flows in, in our blood. So uh, Jan, Gabe, and I all came from CENT and distributed to various uh, campuses. So today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the electrophysiological devices that uh, we develop in, in my lab. Uh, basically, my lab develops technologies that uh, tries to bridge the gap between uh, high resolution mapping that will allow us to look at the cellular activity, which regulate the brain function over large areas of the brain. So we make tools that will allow us to basically probe the intracellular potentials of cells. And these are, uh, for instance, what you see here is the fishbone nanowire implantable device that allows us to record uh, activity from intracellular from neurons across cortical columns. Or we look at uh, penetrating electrodes with a, with a flexible backing so that we don't rub against the brain as it's pulsating. Uh, we have electrodes that could reach deep brain regions. Uh, these uh, follow the same form factor as the deep brain stimulation electrodes. And we have electrodes that we develop electrodes that record the activity from the surface of the brain. So today we're going to focus on this type of electrodes, the electrocorticography electrodes or ECOG electrodes that map the activity from the surface of the brain. And, and here we are able to use uh, uh, advanced manufacturing techniques in thin film microfabrication uh, to be able to pattern thousands of channels over large areas so that we can make the claim of bridging the resolution and the cortical coverage. Usually when one goes to very high spatial resolution, uh, one is limited by the number of channels. So if we are able to do high spatial resolution over broad cortical regions, we'd be able to decode the brain activity at, uh, at a higher level, as uh, I will show some examples here today. So why do we uh, need brain mapping devices? Clinically, we use them for uh, mainly two uh, purposes. The first is diagnostic, and this is for clinical mapping during neurosurgery where uh, people who don't respond to, to drugs like an ep intractable epilepsy have to undergo surgical resection. So to identify uh, locations that are pathologic and uh, separate them at a high scale from functional or eloquent regions of the brain, we use electrical mapping, and this could be done by stimulation and recording or just by passive mapping. And um, it's also used, uh, we, we use these electrodes for uh, therapeutic purposes. Um, this is uh, for neuroprosthesis, for patients who are unable to move their limbs. And what we are looking at here is a picture of, uh, of a subject that uh, was implanted with three Utah arrays. The results appeared from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab at the end of 2020, where he's able, he was able to control basically two robotic hands with the thoughts uh, of, uh, that are decoded uh, by, from the electrical signals in, in his brain. This is using the Utah arrays that you see here uh, on the right. 
And uh, for a number of, of patients who suffer from movement disorders, like in Parkinson's disease, electrical stimulation to deep brain lesions is usually used. And this is uh, another therapeutic uh, application uh, for brain uh, devices. So in, in this talk, I'll show some slides that will have some blood and brain tissue. So uh, viewer discretion is, is uh, you know, asked for here. Uh, first, I'll discuss some of the state-of-the-art brain electrodes, um, the high-density ones. In um, 2018, a group at uh, UCSF, Lauren Frank's group, published a paper on uh, a recording from the mouse's brain with uh, polyimidferads with a number of channels of about 1024 uh, contacts. Um, and then over the last two years, we uh, saw news conferences from uh, Elon Musk's company, Neuralink, in which they are developing um, a robotic implanter for polymer threads that have a number of contacts along their length. And these could be distributed in a way that they could avoid hitting blood vessels in the brain. Now we have some results from animal studies that, that we've seen from this approach. And the hope is that one day it could be used in, in humans. And pushing the number of, uh, of contacts uh, toward hundreds of thousands, a paper came out also toward the end of last year, uh, publishing on uh, about 65,000 uh, channel uh, microarrays. Uh, the images of the arrays are shown on top of here. These are micro needles. And um, uh, some of these needles were implanted in an animal for recording inside the brain. When they are in the high channel number, it's hard to penetrate or damage the brain with this large number of uh, penetrating electrodes. So the recording was done on the surface of the brain. Now, the, the, the most impressive results that came uh, from uh, human brain mapping devices uh, come from Eddie Chang's lab at UCSF, where he uh, uses uh, eco grids that are typically used in epilepsy uh, to record the brain activity of patients during the production of speech. At the same time, they uh, monitored the movement of, of the mouth and um, correlated this movement to the neural activity. And by doing so, they could make decoders that can, that can produce speech, basically, without the patient saying a word, without you know, uh, speaking. And other efforts uh, that are parallel to this uh, also occurring at Johns Hopkins University in Dr. Nathan Crone's lab. Now, for this type of application, what has been uh, used is a grid composed of 256 contacts. And this is built on half a millimeter thick uh, silicone layers. And they are four millimeter apart, and each contact is about 1.17 millimeters. So this greatly undersamples the brain activity from, from the surface of the brain. If we want to increase the spatial resolution and make these contacts smaller, the impedances of these electrodes will start to rise and that will compromise the recording capability of, uh, of these grids. So, um, you know, we pursue basically techniques to, to improve this uh, in terms of the electrophysiological or electrochemical interface. In addition, the thick silicone substrate prevents the conformal uh, adherence to the surface of the brain. So we just uh, saw uh, right here the placement of one of these grids on the cortical surface of, of, a, of a patient. And, and you can see that it's actually sliding on the surface of the patient until the surgeon comes and presses on, on the surface of the grid so that it can adhere to a certain location for recording. So at, at, at UCSD, what, what we've done over the last few years is uh, developed a grid on perylene C substrates. Uh, these substrates are 10 micrometer thick or, or less. Uh, so they are very thin. They can be conformal uh, to, the, uh, to the surface of the brain. And um, over the years, have scaled the number of channels to currently 1024 that's using, used in the operating room. Uh, this is manufactured on large substrates so that we can separate the surgical medium from the lens sterile medium where we will have the electronics uh, to acquire uh, these signals. Uh, 
So this uh, video right here illustrates one placement of the grid on the cortical surface of a patient, where you can see in contrast to the previous video, the grid is really conformal to the curvilinear surface of the brain. And you can see the pulsation the, uh, uh, of, of, of the brain and uh, the blood pulsation, and the grid is really compliant to this pulsation. So it remains fixed in place so that we, we don't basically have noise or change location of the contact during the locate during the recording so today what I'm going to do is um, talk about the science of making these electrodes uh, talk a little bit about the electrochemistry and the fabrication of the contacts that we are using and these are platinum nanorod based arrays uh, some of their benchtop testing and how we scale them to 1024 channel uh, grids and then i'll uh, show one example of recording uh, of cortical columns in, in in rats and then move on to some human experiments where we have uh, some tasks in which the patient is engaged in uh, in either a language or a motor task or during epilepsy monitoring so why does impedance really matter? I, I said earlier that when we scale the metal contacts to small sizes, their impedance rises and that compromises the recording quality. On well, this uh, plot right here uh, basically illustrates uh, really the problem. If we go from one millimeter, well, first let me say what we're looking at. We're looking at the noise voltage as a function of frequency for different diameters. This is the diameter of, of, the, of the metal contact that's open to the electrochemical uh, interface. And um, so we're looking here at, at the noise voltage and as the diameter decreases, we see that the noise voltage rises typically as a function of one over D squared. And uh, when we go to 20 microns, we have about six orders of magnitude higher noise at low frequencies. So this is one over F noise that really climbs up you know, to the sky, basically, when we go to smaller diameters. On the other hand, if we use low impedance contacts, for example, P dot, um, uh, then the one over F noise is really minimized to the instrumentation noise, right? And there is no difference in the noise between large contact and small contact. And the reason there is that we have a lot of adsorption sites for ions. So um, random fluctuations in this vast large number of absorption sites doesn't lead to the one over F noise. Okay, so uh, there are, you know, other issues with a signal, um, uh, with signal decay that, uh, you know, could happen once the leads extend over long distances on the surface of the brain. But this is not as an issue in, with good uh, electronics uh, instrumentation where we have a very high impedance, uh, uh, input impedance of the amplifier usually that parasitic capacitance doesn't matter as much. Uh, also when the contact has a very low impedance. When the contact impedance starts to rise up, then the parasitic coupling and crosstalk between channels start to become an issue. So th this is um, you know, similar to many of the problems that we face in engineering where we know that the interface is really everything it, it uh, overwhelms the bulk properties of, of the materials so how do we couple the, uh, the uh, uh, neural activity so we, we couple neural activity which uh, could be understood as motion of ions or car uh, you know, uh, uh, ionic currents in the medium and uh, we have a, a metal with which we are using to sense this activity. We can sense that motion or the potentials from these ions either by capacitive coupling or with a direct charge transfer with the Faradayic redox reactions. Now, this is obviously surface limited. And if we in, uh, roughen the surface, then uh, we create a larger surface area where we can increase the capacitance and at the same time, we create uh, sharp tips on the rough surface that enhance the electric field and that facilitates the direct uh, charge transfer or the redox reactions. And this has been pursued before with sputtered iridium oxide uh, films. Uh, this is an image of something that could be sputtered. It's rough, has low impedance and what's called high charge injection capacity. On the right hand side, um, we, we see P dot and P dot is one dimensional polymer that has gaps between its polymer chains. So ions can really permeate through the volume of the polymer and you have volumetric sensing as opposed to surface sensing. Uh, 
So what, what makes really a contact great for uh, electrochemical sensing? And this is what uh, the electrochemists called a volcano plot, where, looking, where we're looking at the left on the exchange current at equilibrium. And um, uh, this is as a function of the bond strength. Now, at low bond strength between the ion and the surface of the metal, which we are trying to sense you know, how much ions we have in the medium, when we have low bond strength, ions will come and disorb very quickly, absorb and disorb very quickly. So they have small residence time on the surface. When we go to the other hand, where we have a, uh, um, a, a large bond strength, um, these ions will come sit, participate in, in a uh, uh, electron exchange on a redox reaction, but then the ionized ion sits there for a longer time and it blocks other ions from coming in. And of course, platinum has just the right uh, metal hydrogen bond in this case, so, so that you know, ions will come, ionized, get ionized or participate in a redox reaction and, and clear the space away for another ion to come. So that's why we use platinum as a highly effective catalytic material. So we want to use platinum and we want to, to benefit from the large surface area of the platinum. And if we uh, want to synthesize one dimensional or three dimensional structures of platinum using conventional techniques, we need high temperatures. But these electrodes needs to be made on thin, flexible, polymer-like substrate so that they can adhere to the surface of the brain. And, uh, and therefore we need to come up with a, with a way that um, is compatible basically with this low temperature process. And we found uh, that way, um, uh, that manufacturing way in, in, in a paper that's published in 2001, where they uh, use selective de-alloying. In this case, what, uh, what the authors have done is they uh, co-spattered silver and gold and selectively etched silver from the alloy. So usually silver is etched from the surface and then to minimize the, the, the surface energy of the remaining alloy, silver diffuses to the surface and it gets uh, continuously etched by, by nitric acid. So we tried it for platinum and we were able to tune it by having a nanoporous structure or a one-dimensional structure. So we use the one-dimensional structure in, in this work. This is a scanning electron microscope image on the right of how these contacts would look like. Um, so maybe we look at the cross-section to, to see it a little bit more clear. At, at the bottom of this mesa, we have a, um, uh, a forest of, uh, of nanorods. These are about 400 nanometer tall, about 50 nanometer in, in diameter. And they are assessed at about two microns below the surface of perylene, so that if the grid is slid on the surface of the brain, they don't encounter shear and break away. So it's important for them to be really recessed at the bottom of the, of the contact. And this is a, a, a cross-sectional TM image of, uh, uh, of these rods showing basically the structure on perylene. We have an adhesion layer of chromium and then a planar layer of platinum. And then on top, we have the rods where they are also uh, porous and that enhances you know, their surface area. In addition, they have uh, a large number of um, uh, high order facets or uh, sharp, basically corners in, in their surface morphology. And what that does is that it creates a dipole of charges and that dipole of charges across the, these sharp corners reduces the work function and enhances the catalytic activity uh, in their vicinity. So the work function is basically altered in the vicinity of these uh, high index facets. All right, so um, a couple of slides on their characterization before we start the uh, talking about the animal experiments. Uh, so first we do impedance uh, characterization. This is a three terminal uh, impedance measurements uh, so that we don't alter you know, the potential of, uh, that, that we are trying to measure. And so this is done in reference to a silver silver chloride electrode and we have a counter electrode for the current. The, um, uh, I'm gonna speed up a little bit uh, so that for, for anyone who has questions on, on these techniques, please you know, ask me at the end of the slide so that I can show you, um, uh, can, so, so that I'd be able to cover most of the results that I would like to show you today. And so the impedance usually as a function of frequency goes as a function of one over F. So we have capacitive uh, uh, dominance at low frequencies and then 
uh, it's uh, dominated by the series resistances at higher uh, frequencies. Now we want to benchmark the platinum nanorods with respect to commonly known electrodes, planar platinum, for instance, or P dot PSS. And, um, and this is at 10 Hertz, the, 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 the impedance bang at 10 Hertz, and it's lower than that of P dot or platinum. And at one kilohertz, it's also equivalent to that of, uh, of P dot and much lower than that of, of platinum. Um, so that's what gave rise to the low one over F noise basically in the uh, plots or the spectra that we've seen earlier. Um, the low impedance is also important for the stimulation. Uh, so, what, um, so when we inject a current pulse, basically you would want the, the potential drop to be as linear as possible, meaning that it's capacitively uh, flown into the medium. Once we start to have a nonlinear behavior uh, in the uh, measured potential across the electrode, that means we started initiating Faradaic reactions. And we, of course, want to limit these Faradaic reactions below the water hydrolysis window so that we don't release reactive oxygen into the medium uh, or create uh, hydrogen gas, gas bubbles. And that limit, you know, where we start, where we reach the hydrolysis water window is called the charge injection capacity limit. Uh, it's, it, it takes basically the, the value of current that allowed us to see uh, water hydrolysis and divides, divides the amount of charge that we injected by the cross-sectional area of, of the electrode. And if we do that and we look at the lower right plot right here for platinum P dot, or platinum nanorods, we can see that platinum nanorods have relatively higher um, charge injection capacity uh, over one order of magnitude than planar platinum, and maybe about six times or so than uh, P-dot PSS. And this is good for safety. It's also good for uh, saving power for permanent implants. And that's what the uh, top uh, plot tells us basically if we flow the same amount of current, which is the white uh, biphasic pulse into a platinum contact or a platinum nanorod contact, we built across the electrode a smaller potential on the platinum nanorod compared to platinum. And therefore the power consumed is lower than that with the platinum. So we can have a longer battery life for implants that use the low impedance electrodes. Now there are many limitations you know, to the techniques that, that were presented here and that are conventionally, you know, used in, in, in this field. And, you know, for those who would like to, to discuss more about these limitations, you know, please send me a message or let's talk after uh, the seminar. Right, so they have low impedance. One can also pulse millions of cycles across these electrodes. Their morphology remains to be the same. Impedance doesn't ch change. And uh, if we don't have an open contact, we are pulsing across just the dielectric, which is the perylene passivation. It doesn't open up, right? So with proper design of the metal leads so that they have really very, very low impedance, we avoid the corrosion of the metal leads and these electrodes could work for millions of cycles. Um, and one um, important question is their biocompatibility and stability. Um, I'm not going to show results about biocompatibility here. I, I just remember that I didn't include it. Uh, uh, we didn't see neurosis or changes in neuronal density under the electrodes. And also we uh, had the biocompatibility verified by a third party company, uh, a, uh, an approved medical device company by the FDA to certify that uh, these are biocompatible and uh, they were biocompatible, the platinum nanorods. The slides that are shown here um, relate to the stability of the electrodes uh, in vivo. Uh, this was implanted in a mouse's brain for 42 days, explanted, and then we do FIP cut. And uh, you can see that the density of the wires under the tissue and outside the tissue is the same. Basically the wires are stable in vivo. Right, maybe this image can show things a little bit more clear, right? So you can see here wire distribution outside and inside are relatively the same, right? So we, we don't have wire breakage. And eventually, you know, these wires are actually platinum. They have 5% or less silver. And that's why they were proved to be, to be biocompatible. Now going to the 1024 grids, we basically, the, the main problem is connectorization. How can you connect to, um, um, to uh, 1024 contacts. 
uh, usually what, uh, what we do with tens of contacts is bond ribbon cables on the other side of the electrode and, uh, and you know, use ZIF uh, connectors to be able to, um, uh, to acquire the signals. Um, so, you know, through a process of, of several months, we uh, uh, came to the point where uh, we said, let's use advances that are being used by the um, uh, Intel and the microprocessors where they uh, used a specific type of sockets where a number of pins could latch on a large number of pads. And so the, the one that uh, we are using here is probably a technology of 2007 or so. It's, uh, it uses the LGA 1055 socket. And so that allows us to connect to about 1024 uh, contacts. Now to do that, uh, we basically need to make the electrodes on large substrates. So we use the glass substrates that are typically used to make masks. Uh, these are seven inch plates. And we uh, you know, manufacture the devices on top of these plates. So here you're looking at uh, four uh, copies of the 1024 grid. Um, on top is, are the contacts on the bottom. You know, these contact sizes are determined by the LGA matching socket, right? And then we can scale this to, to larger number of channels. We've used uh, uh, 2048 channels so far, and we think we can go several thousands more. We have 4096 in mind, but, you know, this could, you know, keep scaling. Um, and you can see in the center of, uh, of the grid, we have a lot of holes. These are uh, to, um, holes to perfuse the CSF from under the grid and also to do electrical simulation across the grid as we will uh, discuss later. Now the design is flexible so that uh, you can, you know, bring the contacts further away from each other or closer together. And so this is a high density grid uh, that has 200 micron pitch in a 16 by 64 fashion or uh, 150 micron pitch. So that's distributed over 4.8 millimeter by 4.8 millimeter. Sorry. So, uh, so this is um, a close-up image of, uh, of the grid. And then you can see the platinum nanorod contacts with the metal leads. And in between them, we can see the perfusion holes. And this is an SEM image that again illustrates the same, right? Where the platinum nanorods are recessed under the, you know, below the perylene surface. And, uh, and we have the holes across the whole perylene C layer. All right. So, uh, how about the yield of impedances? Well, usually we get over 900 channels uh, of, of working devices. That is with impedances of about 10 kilo ohms for a 30 micron diameter contact. And um, we are showing here the best devices. So in, in, in good days, you know, we could get up to 99.4% yield or so. This is both for the 1024 grids and for the 2048 grids and very tight distribution of, uh, of the impedance. Now, when we do the recordings, we usually uh, reject the recordings from channels that are that have an impedance of 100 kilo ohms or more. And that's because these higher impedance channels will couple noise. Right? so we really would like to have a very narrow distribution of the contacts to start with, of the impedances of the contacts to start with. And so, we started experiments on, uh, on an animal model that's really well understood uh, to map the whisker barrel cortex. And this is where the electrode was, uh, was placed. As uh, you can see in the lower image here, the, these are again at 150 micron spacing. And uh, we use an air pop stimulator uh, so that air is pulsed on specific whiskers. And these whiskers are colored before the experiment or you know, shaved so that we, we can have better localization for the experiment that we are trying to do. Now, this is on, on the right is a snapshot of, of recording uh, across the 1024 channels, uh, you know, centered at the region where we have the highest response. And, and you can see that the response is selective to some regions and uh, some other regions don't respond. And, and there is, of course, a traveling wave uh, that you can start to see basically even from, from this image. Right. so if we look at the spatial distribution of, of the response, this is um, basically, what we were looking at is uh, the raw data without, without filtering. And this is also the raw data here from 50 trials that, that are averaged. And this is for uh, E3 whisker stimulation. And we can see a localized activity in the lower left region of the grid. And we go to E4, it's even a little bit more uh, to the left. Now, 
when we filter the data in different frequency bands that correspond to the activity in the brain, uh, we find the expected that as you go to higher frequencies, you can better localize the activity. So we use the what's called the gamma band, which is between 30 and 190 hertz, to localize the responses on the surface of the brain. So now uh, we look at trials in, in different rats. Uh, so in this, this is the first rat, maybe I'll just stick here for a second. And uh, these are different whiskers that have been stimulated with this air puff experiment. And you can see that the local activity uh, extends over about a half a millimeter here, right? By half a millimeter. So we're looking at uh, you know, a subcortical organization or a cortical organization of, uh, of, of the barrel whiskers and uh, from the surface of the brain with, with this technique. Because we know cortical columns are usually several hundred microns to a millimeter in, in diameter. Uh, so of course our approach here allows us to map the function of these barrels from the surface of the brain. So the first rat, um, and then we looked at three other rats. So in total, we have four rats. This is the last rat that, that we've done in which multiple air puff experiments as well as electrical stimulation has been done to uh, you know, map the activity from the surface of the brain. And then for, for this rat, we've done staining and, um, uh, and then we, we took the coordinates of uh, the location of the grid on, on the surface of the brain. And now we can overlay you know, our uh, high gamma mapped activity with the whisker barrels that you can see here. So the VGOL2 allows us to uh, basically um, um, uh, stain individual columns um, in the barrel cortex. So once we overlapped you know, the functional activity over the columns, we see a high degree of agreement uh, that uh, you know, we can correlate function with the anatomical boundaries that we see with uh, staining. So this was encouraging. And um, uh, if we compare it with how this has been done in the past uh, to map these cortical columns, usually it's done by a sequential uh, process of placing a needle and stepping it over the cortical surface in order to map boundaries. Uh, of course, this approach allows us to just slap the electrode on the surface of the brain and uh, you know, do the stimulation. Uh, paradigms and, and map it all in one shot without moving the electrode. Now, you know, we started to see signatures of traveling waves and we wanted to understand a little bit better what we are seeing. So uh, we resorted to uh, earlier results from our colleagues, um, uh, Cash and Halgren, who I will introduce later in, in, in my slides, uh, who have done mapping from uh, epilepsy patients uh, during sleep. And what they have observed uh, uh, is uh, rotating waves that are measured on, on these epilepsy grids that were associated with the memory consolidation. And the way they do this is that they take the spatial derivative of the phase uh, of, of the waveform so that they can know the propagation direction. So we've applied the, the same techniques to the recordings from the rats that, that we've done. And uh, here we're looking at the E4 uh, uh, responses. In the background, we can see the potential. So the red is high potential. This is the responsive region actually for the E4. And you know, the green, the, sorry, the blue is the low potential. And then the arrows indicate the spatial derivative of uh, of the face. So we can see that uh, basically where we measure the responses, we have what looks like to be a source of a wave that propagates and sinks basically in the low amplitude, uh, low voltage regions. And you know, at, at boundaries between propagating waves, we start to see spiral-like wave patterns on the surface, all with you know, a footprint that's smaller than one millimeter. So this is the power of going to a very high spatial resolution with a large cortical coverage, where you can really see those, uh, those details. If we undersample uh, uh, these uh, uh, recordings, then you start to lose information. You know, this is obvious, but uh, these pictures I can actually show you how much information we lose from when we go from 32 by 32 to eight by eight, which is the typical uh, number of contacts used in, in animal or in, in human experiments. Right, so, and, and these uh, wave patterns apply to all stimulation paradigms that, that, that we've done. 
All right, so what are the smallest functional units now that we can resolve from the surface of, of the human brain? And, and, and this started in a collaboration with my colleague, uh, Eric Halligran here at UCSD and a neurosurgery resident who's co-advised by, by both of us, Dan Cleary. We know, you know, in animals, these have been measured, the cortical columns, to have diameters of about a millimeter or so, but we don't know how much they measure in, in humans. And the way the experiments are done is that, uh, you know, we, we place the electrodes on consented patients who agree to participate in, in our trials. And first, um, mapping is done by the clinical grid. So we know where the superior temporal gyrus in this case is located. And that's associated with, with processing uh, language and sounds. And then we place our grid just uh, over that location. So in the first few experiments, we used the uh, smaller channel count, 128 or so. And then in the later experiments, I'll show you the 1024 uh, recordings. So this was a, a high pitch uh, or a small pitch electrode uh, where the separation between the contacts was 50 micrometers and had two columns. And the patient in this case was listening to different vowels and different sounds. And while the patient is listening to sounds, we're recording the activity from the surface of the brain. And here the data is processed so that we're looking at the high gamma activity as a function of time. So we're looking basically here at the amplitude across the length of the array on the y axis and uh, on the x axis as a function of time. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so, so what we're seeing um, here is that there are distinctive responsive regions in, in the grid. When the sounds that the patient is, is, is listening to, uh, the arrangement of the letters don't make sense. One region of, um, um, of the strip is highly responsive. And there is a sharp transition to the non-responsive region. On the other hand, when we have just noise and no vowels or um, other sounds are being produced as noise, um, the, the other region on the grid is, is highly responsive. When there are words that are spoken, the same you know, location where the patient was trying basically to make sense of, uh, of the words that he's uh, listening to, he or she are listening to, and this region is responsive. Now, this is repetitive between you know, about 15, 20 patients on which this type of grid was, was placed, even though the transition, of course, varies with location in, in, within the depth of the grid. And so what we think we are looking at here is the functional boundary between different cortical columns that, uh, that process language. And if we take, you know, line cuts across these boundaries, uh, we can see that between the responsive and non-responsive regions, we have a transition region of about 500 microns, 450 or so, to about 200 microns. So really sharp transitions between what we believe to be uh, cortical boundaries. So now the strip that I showed earlier, which has 16 by 64 contacts at 200 micron pitch, is being used to identify these cortical boundaries for the functional units that, that process speech. Now, for uh, the remainder of, uh, uh, of, of, of the recordings that I will show here, they were done with uh, uh, a very talented neurosurgeon from OHSU. My colleague's name is Ahmad Raslan, and uh, this is in collaboration with his, uh, with his group. Uh, so in, in total at OHSQ, we've, uh, we've done about 130 patient rec recordings with uh, tens of channels and the 1024 channels. So these are some of the results from the 1024 grids. The first experiment that we're looking at is uh, used for the central sulcus mapping. Basically before a resection uh, for patients who are undergoing resection, mapping of the motor and the sensory region has to be done. And that's usually done by a technique called phase reversal technique where the peripheral nerve in the limbs is stimulated hands or legs. And then they, um, and then they measure from the surface of the brain using the ECOG grids, the waveforms, and look for the phase reversal, where the phase of, of the waveforms changes polarity. So in, in this case, we have a phase reversal at this boundary, where we go basically from a negative phase to more of a positive phase. 
right? And, and that determines the central sulcus location typically um, uh, or the functional boundary between the primary motor and the primary sensory uh, cortex. Now, in, in most of these patients had uh, lesions in, in, in their brain and they were undergoing resection. So in, in principle, the functional boundary is perceived to really uh, co-localize with, uh, with the central sulcus. But uh, due to brain plasticity, once we have a lesion in the brain, that boundary could shift the functional boundary. And this is one of the examples where we can measure the shift in that boundary and at a very high resolution. So, so we use that information that we see on the left with the different uh, polarity of, of the waveforms. And uh, we plot on the first instance the potential. And, um, and you can see that there is a, a boundary mainly defined by this region right here, where this polarity is very clear in the waveforms. Now, if we do correlation between the different channels with the positive, with the very clear positive or very clear negative, we have what's called a correlation map that identifies now a, a better functional boundary between the sensory region and the motor region. Right, so now we can basically see that this boundary can be determined at a millimeter scale. You could imagine if this is done with a uh, the centimeter space platinum eco contacts that are used in the clinic, we wouldn't be able to see this curvilinear nature that uh, that we are looking at here. But now we will basically use this in the uh, upcoming experiments. So. So while while the electrode is, is placed on the surface of the brain, uh, a lot of times the patient is awake uh, so that they are mapping you know, the functional regions of the brain either by, stimulating, by stimulation and looking at the response, change in behavior, like sluggish uh, uh, speech, for example, uh, or by uh, asking the patient to perform motor tasks uh, while they are recording from the surface. So in this case, we, we made a, a custom uh, glove where it has a number of sensors on, on the surface so that we can decode which, uh, which finger is being uh, you know, moved and when it moved so that we can lock the activity that's measured from the surface of the brain to the hand movements. No, so this went through generations of, uh, of, of development uh, from a graduate student in, in my lab. And you know, eventually we went to the strip uh, approach because patients have different sizes of their fingers and hands. And so a specific glove doesn't work for, uh, for everyone. And so there are two experiments that I'm going to show here. The first one is uh, responses to vibrotactile stimulation of the different fingers. And this is on the same patient where we've done the uh, uh, functional boundary mapping. And now when we see that the vibration goes from the thumb to the index of the middle finger ring pinky, you know, different regions from the sensory cortex are, are being uh, evoked. So these are the neural correlates for these different fingers in the sensory cortex. Right? And, you know, once more, how do we localize this with respect to the, the boundaries that we've identified? Uh, this is the central sulcus just under the large vein. We have the functional boundary and some of the contacts respond to more than one finger. And, um, and, and their representation is done by a pie chart like uh, uh, plot uh, in here. So, so basically what this is telling us is that we can, we can map you know, the neural correlates for individual finger movements from or sensory um, um, uh, responses from the surface of the brain. Uh, for this particular task, we need more trials and more subjects to confirm uh, our findings. Now, the second experiment involves a hand grabbing experiment where the patient is just closing their fist. And we're looking first at the potentials during uh, this fist grabbing uh, uh, task. And so first um, 85 milliseconds after the patient starts closing their hand, we can see potential peaks in the motor region of, of the cortex. And then in the middle and later on uh, in, in the movement when it's about to close, we can see that the sensory region is activated. Basically a feedback mechanism to adjust basically how uh, the hand is being closed where the motor seems to be not participating in, um, in, uh, uh, in the activity. Now, 
before the movement and after the movement, we can use this uh, spatial derivative of the phase in order to look at the propagating waves. And then we use streamlines in MATLAB to dictate the major propagating waves across long distances from the cortical surface. And, uh, and here we can see basically during the planning of, uh, of the movement that we have a wave pattern uh, that uh, starts from the sensory uh, cortex and goes toward the motor region and, and, and is directed um, nearly toward the region that was activated right here that we saw was, uh, to have high amplitude during the motion. And then after the hand is closed, this activity is reversed and you see the wave is going from the motor to, to the sensory region. Now the raw waveforms are actually these are the filtered waveforms are, are shown here on the right, uh, showing basically a, wave, a propagation uh, again from the sensory to the motor and then motor to the sensory. This is along the yellow line that, that you see right here. Right, so now we can basically look at a spatial temporal uh, map of, uh, of, of the function that's involved in motor or in sensory activity, that rather than looking at just potentials. We can interpret activity or potentially cognition uh, in the form of brain waves as, as opposed to a fixed local uh, potential changes. And you know this uh, uh, GIF here shows basically the, uh, the, the full time scale um, um, rearrangement of these vectors uh, or the wave propagation uh, during the grabbing task. So it starts at zero milliseconds now. And, and you can see in the background are the potentials that are flip, flip flopping. And alongside with these potentials, you know, these uh, uh, wave vectors align uh, to go to or away from these potentials. When I look at this, I, uh, uh, I and, and, and the motion is slowed down so that they look like seaweeds in, under the ocean, right? If you uh, come snorkeling to San Diego, you would uh, be able to see a similar behavior. And so it's the same type of waves. Now the grids that uh, are placed on, on the cortical surface have holes in them. So that means uh, the typical clinical procedures could be done while the electrode is placed without removing it, that is, you know, the surgeon can place their bipolar stimulator where, you know, they, they basically stimulate what the patient is doing something and look at disruption of function through the grid and we'd be recording uh, through, throughout this time. Now this is mapping from an epilepsy patient and uh, uh, there are multiple uh, stimulation cycles. This is a response from one of them. Uh, this is where the current, bi bipolar current, two milliamps uh, biphasic current was applied. And then a few seconds afterwards, we can start to see these charges uh, that are happening uh, across the whole grid. In some cases, uh, these discharges have a time delay. Right, so this is a zoom in on, on a line of, uh, of, of these contacts where we see what's typically called IIDs or interictal discharges interactive dis discharges. And, um, you know, the, the responses of these discharges could be correlated with the stimulation point. So let's look at this in, in the next slide. Um, basically, uh, though this is a busy figure, I'll try to, uh, to explain it slowly. Uh, so on the top, basically what we are looking at is uh, uh, multiple stimulation pulses. And then in each pulse, we can see that the activity starts over, um, I, I made a mistake, this is spontaneous recording. So these are discharges that are spontaneously recorded from the surface of the brain without any stimulation. And, uh, and they occur, uh, you know, every two seconds or so. And, um, and then we can see in, in every occurrence, they uh, appear on a small number of channels and then spread to the remainder of the grid. And this is a zoom in of, of these. Basically, whenever we have a red dot, this is an event. And that event is an epileptic discharge, basically. And uh, you know, the lower right uh, uh, panel shows uh, basically the raw waveforms that are measured and shows some delay between you know, these events. Now, if we look at the spatial map, 
Um, uh, what's labeled here is the superior temporal cell cost, uh, uh, where we are currently trying to correlate basically what we are measuring with the pathology that was determined from fMRI. And um, you can see that the uh, discharge um, happens, and we've seen it across all trials, uh, at the lower right column. And then as the time uh, uh, lapses, this discharge goes from the lower right and spreads across the array to the other regions of the array. And then it becomes quiet again, where exits basically at the lower left, and then it repeats the cycle. Now, with the stimulation, uh, this is what we see on, on, on this side. Now we look again at the spatial map. The two red dots are where the bipolar simulator was placed. And we can see that this discharge is now in this case uh, don't start at the lower right, they start where we have stimulated and spread from the stimulation point across the whole tissue. Right, so, so we can reverse or disrupt the epileptogenic waveforms by electrical stimulation. And, um, you know, on the right hand side, um, we again look at the events in red across the 1024 channels. So it starts at a small location, typically where we stimulate and then spreads. And these are the IIDs that are typically uh, recorded uh, uh, using clinical electrodes. And so now with, with this type of measurement, we can basically look at epilepsy as, as a network of different nodes where the epileptic discharges uh, evolve. And potentially we can create uh, um, uh, um, techniques to disrupt that pathology or treat epilepsy at these nodes that we can record with the high spatial resolution and the high uh, cortical coverage. And um, this is, uh, I'll show this and then I'll stop. So this is the last illustration of, of this grid. Uh, basically, um, what Ahmed asked us to do is uh, if we can create basically a flap within the array so that this flap can be placed, we can record from the 1024, but then he would know where the lesion is or where the tumor is so that he can operate. So he basically flips back the contacts, operates while we're recording around the, the tumor and then place the, the flap again. So he did try that, um, except that the location of the tumor was a little bit offset from where uh, the flap was uh, was was done, and uh, so he cut through the electrode a little bit. But then you can still see that you know while he is operating and trying to look at the boundaries of uh, of of the tumor that the grid is placed on the surface and it's recording throughout this procedure. And you know for those who would like to know more about you know these techniques, there is a um, uh, a documentary on on Netflix, the Surgeon's Cut. I think it's the second. Uh, um, you know, documentary uh, in, in, in that series, uh, basically that shows a similar technique where, you know, a large, uh, uh, um, a large grid is being used for exactly the same thing, uh, 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 doing the surgical procedure in the center of a grid while recording at the same time. All right, so this is um, basically all that uh, I wanted to talk about with respect to the surface grids. There are uh, other forms of uh, uh, or ways we can interface with the brain. This is a paper that appeared uh, in the end of uh, 2020 in which a monkey was implanted with 16 of these UTA arrays in their visual cortex. And uh, by stimulation, that monkey was, was blind, was able to know the shapes of the objects in, in, in his field of motion. I wouldn't say his field of view because he cannot see. So basically they enabled the monkey to, to recognize the shapes of the objects and their trajectory by stimulation of, uh, um, of the visual cortex. And uh, you know, this is done uh, with the Utah array on, on a thick glass substrate. And what we've been doing over the last eight years, actually we're developing this specific platform is to make a similar structure, but on a flexible substrate and scale it to thousands of channels. And eventually we're able to do that and carry some um, um, uh, animal experiments.
So where we're heading is, um, you know, basically simplifying clinical procedures. In some cases, the epilepsy patients have to stay in the uh, epilepsy monitoring unit for two weeks or so. And uh, they have, uh, uh, during this time, they have to have these wires coming out from, from through their scalp, basically, uh, from the electrodes that are placed on their brain. And, um, and they are bulky and they you know, have hard time to change their clothes and so on. They're very inconvenient. So we're trying to make this uh, as a wireless uh, interface from the large number of channels, I'm trying to, uh, to do micro stimulation to encode sensation for uh, prosthetics. Right, so I, I hope that in, in this talk, I um, was able to show you something interesting about the science of, of the microelectrodes and the uh, um, um, new results in animal mapping of their cortical uh, uh, columns from the surface of the brain and how we can apply this technology for uh, human mapping. So this is uh, you know, done with a, a uh, a large collaboration with a number of, uh, of colleagues. Uh, primarily, we started this work with Eric Halligren and Sid Cash at MGH. And uh, the two people or the three people who really led this are neurosurgery residents and an early uh, career faculty, uh, uh, Angelique. Dan is here at UCSD, almost done with, uh, with his residency program and Jimmy is, 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 is done this year. And Ahmed at OHSU, we have a number of animal uh, collaborators uh, didn't show results uh, from their labs. And the same electrodes we're using in, in the spinal cord for mapping and decoding activity from the surface of the spinal cord. And these are my colleagues and collaborators on, on this. So this work was uh, supported initially by the Center of Brain Activity uh, at UCSD, Brain Activity Mapping and uh, the NSF, and more recently the NIH. And, um, I'm always grateful for uh, for SIN for allowing me to start this work and uh, bring it here with me to UCSD. So thank you for your attention. And I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Fantastic, Shadi. Thank you so much for showing us um, just the application for material science is, is so large and so impactful, right? You're, you're able to change people's ability um, with your materials and you're, you're doing something that most of us are not, which is actually getting your materials out there to be used and tested right away. And that's just fantastic. That's the um, hope, that's the hope and the goal. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, raise your hands um, or just speak up if you want. I'll ask one quick question. I see a couple hands up. So, you know, years ago, I would always hear things in the MRS, a lot of chatter about how much you had to, how much a person should match the moduli of their um, electrode to the moduli of the brain. But I'm not, send, I'm not getting the idea that that's actually important given the dimensionality of your platinum electrode. Yeah, in, in, indeed, we make them so thin so that the difference in moduli doesn't matter. And this is when they are on the surface of, of the brain. If, if they go deep into the tissue, then there will be consequences. So really what is needed is scaling when the moduli is, is high so that uh, the brain doesn't recognize it as a foreign element. So the thinner and the smaller it is, the better it will be its function in the brain. That's fantastic. Alex, I think you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was just looking when you're doing the mapping of like finger movement and hand movement, yeah. and you were showing different um, how the brain reacted to that. Have you looked yes. at doing a, com a com like a computer model that would almost simulate that in a way so that you could say, oh, if you touch this finger, this is what's going to happen in the brain and compare that? Yeah, so this is the eventual goal basically is to make a motor prosthetic and to be able to send sensations back from the fingers to those specific regions from which we measure the vibrotactile uh, uh, responses and encode sensation back so that we can have a closed loop like prosthetic. We have not done that here yet, but you know, other colleagues, I showed Nathan Crohn's uh, work uh, from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins and with his colleagues at the Applied Physics Lab, you know, they, they started to have a closed loop interface for prosthetics where they can map that activity uh, for individual fingers and different, uh, you know, movements of the hand and to be able to grasp things. So there is, you know, a video illustration that's available on YouTube uh, 
where that patient can use basically two robotic hands to cut a cake and eat it with the, with the brain signals. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, just to clarify, when you say closed loop, that means when um, when that robotic hand touches something, it gives that sensory input back to the brain, so the brain knows how hard it's touching. Exactly, it. exactly, yes, and how hard they need to grab, you know, more on that object. That's that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Vince? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so at the very beginning, I saw that you said uh, this could be applied potentially to some Parkinson's uh, disease research. Um, my mom has Parkinson's and I was just wondering if, if you had any uh, experience in looking at any applications with Parkinson's disease or if you had any information on that, that'd be really interesting. Yes, so um, the electrodes that I presented about today um, might be used for closing the loop in Parkinson's but the essential electrodes are those that penetrate to deep brain layers. And those have a higher barrier for translation uh, because mm -hmm. they need to stay in the brain for longer amounts of time and they really need to cut through the tissue to reach to the hippocampus, for example, or the amygdala and so on. So um, uh, the electrodes that we're doing, I showed some image of like a deep inflatable electrode that uh, could go to those structures has uh, been used in, in the cortex of a humans acutely, but hasn't been used in, you know, for uh, uh, stimulation applications in deep brain regions. Um, the surface electrodes would be used basically to tell the stimulator once the stimulation is done, well, I, I see activity on this brain region and this, is, this will induce a side effect. So you might want to change the stimulation parameters. And that's how, what's called closing the loop in these stimulators happen. And, and I know for epilepsy patients, there is what's called the responsive uh, 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 neural system that uh, basically you know, stimulates to calm down the epileptic discharges and it has a recording set of electrodes to be able to, uh, to close the loop. Uh, but this is you know, all technology that needs to be upgraded with these high resolution techniques that are being developed currently in, in research. Uh, so that's as much as I can tell you, but I'd be happy yeah. to connect you, you know, with, uh, with my colleagues who do these surgeries and implement, impl implant you know, these electrodes for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and, and others. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd, that'd be so, good to look into. Thank you so much. That was a very welcome. interesting talk. Yeah. Yep. Feel free to email me afterwards. Hi, I had a question. Um, yes. Whether it's patients or humans or mice, are they put under, and if so, how do the anesthetics affect either magnetic stimulations or neural activity? It, it does, you know, the type of anesthetics that's used uh, could really, you know, dumb down the activity from the surface of the brain. So for the, um, for the animal experiments that we have, we have shown, th this is a light anesthetic in which you know, the, uh, the animal is uh, not fully asleep, can respond to stimuli, but it's asleep enough so that it doesn't feel the pain. Now, how does the anesthetics affect in general the brain activity is really a subject of research that I wish I could say, you know, we can understand it or other people understand it, but the likelihood of that is, is low. How it works actually is still not very well understood. So does it affect, maybe I'll give you an answer. Uh, does it affect? Yes, it definitely affects. How? I don't know. I, and I don't know if others know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Steve? Are there, uh, yeah, and I, I have a, a question. I just want to jump in if others are, have others. Um, so one thing I like, I just hope my face wasn't on this because there's a reason I didn't go into biomedical research. I'm just way too squeamish. And, and so I, I'm sure I was making a lot of faces during here. Just, just amazing stuff though. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Thanks for the talk, Shadi. I have a question in terms of, you know, um, when looking at like the, the, the spatial distribution and, you know, whether it's the mouse or the human, the 2D mapping looks pretty good. And, 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 and you'd mentioned that, you know, you have the ability to increase the density of these and, and you could go down, but where, where do you think you need to be in terms of that spatial resolution? Because, you know, it looks like you're getting pretty good uh, um, correlation 
and this ability to map in, in, in the spatial and even the temporal regime, right? I imagine temporally also because of these being the, 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 the pathways that are yeah. associated with these, that, that there probably are uh, lower limits to those. How, where do you think you need to get to really be able to drive home some of these goals? I think we are at the resolution that we need, which is a few hundred microns. And so we saw that the transitions right between, you know, the responses in language, for example, were about 200 microns wide. So really, the, let me give you a better scientific answer. I, I think the function is correlated to cortical columns, right? And we are mapping from the surface the activity that's propagated from, you know, deeper layers through the cortical column to the surface. There are some interconnects between the cortical columns, but now we can even measure those from the surface. So really the resolution would be the same spatial resolution of the anatomical cortical columns, which is sub-millimeter, but not below 100 micrometers. Yeah, no, okay, perfect. Thanks so much, that's, that's what it seemed like. Uh, Anthony, I saw your hands up. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just had a question about your use of nanowires, because um, yes. I know there's uh, also this uh, evolution of uh, bio-inspired uh, membrane uh, electronics or uh, flexible electronics. Why do you choose to use nanowires over something that's more like bio-inspired membrane electronics? Well, for that particular case, we wanted to puncture through the cell membrane and measure the activity from inside the cell. So all, all the other techniques, as, as far as I can tell, measure extracellular activity, like you know what I have shown today. And to be able to measure small potential fluctuations that occur prior to the spikes, then you need to measure things from inside the cell. So we make these penetrating wires so that uh, we can penetrate into some of these cells and try to basically correlate how do, you, do these intracellular potentials correlate with what we measure from the surface of the brain or at depth next to them? That, that's, that's why we are using nanowires. Okay. For, yeah. yeah. The Thanks. other techniques are extracellular recording techniques. Oh, okay. So you, you're, it's mostly if you use something that's on the surface level, then it's not actually reading what's happening within the actual neuron itself. Yeah, and even inside the tissue, right? If you have, you know, electrodes that penetrate inside the tissue, they don't penetrate the cell bodies, right? They penetrate the structure around the tissue. But um, to measure these intracellular potential, you need to be inside the cell. And that's where, you know, something like this would, would help. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you, um, Shadi. I, I'm sure people would sit here and, and talk to you for quite a long time, but I, I yeah. It's great. Another time. reason to visit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we would love for you to come up. I, I just love um, direct application of material science and physics, and, and that's something you're really showing us. Is, and that's just, it's phenomenal work as usual. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you again, Shadi. We really appreciate it. And just always. A pleasure. Pleasure. Yeah, th thanks, Shadi. That was tremendous. You know, we need to have you come just to talk about the fab process on, on some of these materials, which is, I, I know, like, uh, that, that's not trivial in itself. Not at all. And in fact, Shadi, you know, has, has skipped all of that to tell yeah. you all the beautiful in vivo work, but that is, in itself is, is elegance and uh, totally. quite substantive um, improvement. Yeah, I would be remiss not to mention actually Yong Ben Shui. I think I had his picture on the slide and I should acknowledge him and I didn't. And that would be too bad. But he is really the person who made these electrodes on the large wafers. And, you know, he owes, uh, he's owed a lot of the credit for this work. He's a postdoc about to finish his, his post. So I'm trying to convince him to stay here. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Shadi. This was just absolutely amazing. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's yeah. really a pleasure. And I, I enjoyed this. And thank you for all your questions. I look forward to meeting you one day. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you soon, Shadi. Take care. All right. See you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>